Welcome colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us. It's a great pleasure that you could join us today. We are looking forward to having an interactive, engaging and fruitful discussion. We are looking forward to learning from our esteemed panelists, uh, but most importantly, we are also hoping that we will learn from you. And the community is only a community with members and you are a very critical component of the membership of the Sustainable Energy Community of Practice. My name is Geoffrey Omedo. I'm the Community Manager Sustainable Energy in UNDP. It's a great pleasure for me to host you today. And we are looking forward to a very interactive session. The colleagues allow us to give uh, 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 many of the other colleagues who are still joining uh, time to join so that we can all start together. So I'll be with you shortly when we are officially starting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. Empowering Voices, Building a Just Energy Transition Through Civic Engagement. We have a wonderful team of panelists here today that are going to share their insights and some of the lessons that they have been able to learn in this very, very critical uh, subject. I think this is the third of the sessions we've been having, and there have been a lot of lessons that have been emerging from our energy governance uh, conversations. We look forward again today now to delving on the subject of engagement and particularly how do we bring all the voices on the table in today's discussion. This webinar is being co-hosted by the Sustainable Energy Community of Practice and the Governor's Community of Practice. Without much ado, allow me now to bring in our director, uh, UNDP Sustainable Energy Hub, uh, Riyad Medeb, to give his official opening remarks. Welcome, Riyad. Thank you, Geoffrey, and thank you all Ladies and gentlemen, and all esteemed participants and speakers, welcome to our third webinar, as mentioned by uh, Geoffrey, on energy governance, where today we will delve uh, into the vital nexus of civic engagement and empowerment in shaping a just energy transition. And as we gather here, it is paramount to not only recognize the significance of this principle, but also explore how we can effectively translate them into actionable strategies. So the question before us today is multifaceted. How do we ensure that all stakeholders, particularly marginalized groups, are not only included, but actively engage in energy-related discussion and decisions? That is a very important question. My second question, and perhaps more critically, how can the UNDP provide tangible support to countries in realizing this objective. So we are expecting from the discussion some ideas, some solution, but also from you uh, at the country level. Let us begin by acknowledging that civic engagement is not merely an idealistic pursuit, but a pragmatic necessity, especially in the context of creating an effective energy governance. And in UNDP vision for just affordable and reliable clean energy transitions aims not only to mitigate the environmental impact of fossil fuel, but also to foster societal resilience and equity. However, achieving this uh, vision demand more than just theories and aspiration. It requires concrete actions grounded in transformative sustainable development approach. Allow me to underscore three key areas where the integration of civic engagement and empowerment can drive tangible progress in our energy transition effort. Firstly, fostering ownership and shared responsibility among citizens is pivotal. When communities are actively involved in shaping energy policies and projects, they develop a deeper understanding of the issues at hand and vested interest in, the, in their outcome. Empirical evidence from initiatives like the UNDP Enhanced Rural Resilience Project in Yemen reveals that community-led efforts, particularly those involving women and youth, have significantly increased the adoption of renewable energy technologies 
and improve energy access in rural areas. Secondly, equipping stakeholders with the necessity knowledge, skills, and resources is paramount for effective participation. Investment in an education, outreach program, and initiative like the UNDP Solar Mamas program in Belize demonstrates the importance of empowering individuals to become active contributors to sustainable energy development. Throughout this project, indigenous women engineers have installed solar system to four indigenous community impacting over 1,000 residents. So data from the UNTP small grant program highlight that communities with access to tailored training and technical support have shown a remarkable increase in renewable energy adoption rates and leading to tangible improvement in what is important for us is the livelihood and the environmental sustainability. Lastly, embracing diversity and inclusivity is fundamental to ensure that no voice goes unheard in our energy transition journey. By recognizing and addressing systemic inequalities, such as the uh, underrepresentation of women and minority group in the energy sector, we can unlock and tap potential and foster more resilient and responsive energy system. Recent studies indicate that companies and organizations with diverse leadership teams are more likely to innovate and achieve better financial performance, underscoring the business case for inclusive energy governance. In conclusion, as uh, we chart our course toward the sustainable energy future, let us not underestimate the power of civic engagement and empowerment. By harnessing the collective agency of individuals and communities, we can overcome the challenges that lie ahead and build a more inclusive, equitable, and resilient energy landscape for generations to come. Thank you very much. Pius to you. Thank you very much, Ria. Thanks very much for your insightful remarks and uh, bringing the importance of civic engagement and uh, the inclusion and the diversity for achieving this uh, just energy transition. So with this, uh, I think uh, you have set the stage. I think uh, we'll directly go into the uh, panel discussion. And uh, let me bring the speakers now. Um, I'll briefly introduce here uh, the panel. So we have got uh, uh, Emanuele Sapienza, uh, who is the global lead uh, open and inclusive public sphere from UNTP. We have got Sreshta Banerjee, uh, who is the director of India Just Transition Center, International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. We have got David Arinje, who is the youth representative at the UNDP External Advisory Group on Energy Governance. We have got Kestosis Kupses, who is the member of the European Commission, uh, European Economic and Social Committee, and Vice President of the Lithuanian Consumer Alliance. And finally, we have got Bertha Dalmini, who is the President of the African Women in Energy and Power. So we've got a very diverse and a very strong panel today, uh, and we'll hear the insights on uh, insights and best practices on civic uh, engagement and empowerment, and how that can help us to achieve a just energy transition. So I welcome uh, I welcome you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all our speakers for joining today. And with this, let's go directly deep dive into this topic. So uh, I would like to uh, maybe uh, give kind of you know initial uh, few minutes to each uh, speakers uh, to to bring their initial perspectives and remarks, and then uh, we'll open it for your questions uh, from the participants. Uh, Feel free to any time during this conversation, feel free to drop, drop in your ideas in the chat box if you have any questions, because we are more interested to respond your questions and uh, uh, sharing your insights into this conversation. So with this, let me go to uh, Emmanuel. Um, maybe uh, Joffrey, if you want to remove this, uh, the panel, yeah, if you can do this. Yeah, thank you. Um, Emanuele, over to you for, uh, you know, maybe, uh, as I said, you are leading this, uh, the UNDP Global Program on Open and Inclusive Public uh, Sphere. Uh, maybe you want to share a bit on what, what does it mean exactly for UNDP? What, what is open and inclusive public sphere? And if you can also talk about 
how you and DP is working on civic engagement and empowerment, and why do you think this is really critical for just energy transition? So over to you. Thank you, Piyush. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Perfect. So first of all, of course, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this very important conversation for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So on, on what, what we mean by, by civic engagement, I think civic engagement is one of these concepts on which there is a lot of consensus at the headline level, so to speak, but actually significant divergence just beneath. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody who as a general statement of principle would say, citizen participation is not important. You'd be really hard pressed to find somebody who would say that. However, different people may have and typically have very different understandings of what civic engagement is and what it should look like in practice. And it is true that civic engagement can be many different things. So as a first approximation, you can think about civic engagement as the process through which members of society are individually or collectively engage outside of institutions, outside of the market, to pursue a certain vision of development that relates to them, maybe their interests, their, their aspirations or their community or other communities. So that's a starting point. But how can we unpack that a little bit more? And we're often, as you can imagine, confronted with that question. So we developed a bit of a, of a model, if you want to call it that way, that, that we think, we hope can be useful uh, to, to think in a more articulated way about civic engagement and perhaps useful to our conversation today. So we can start from, let's call it the primary focus of engagement. So uh, the primary focus of my engagement may be the state, the state in its different manifestations, the government or a local authority or, or, or any other institution really. And I might engage with the state because I want to change the way in which the state, state institutions do things. I want to influence policy. Or perhaps I'm not so interested in influencing present or future policy, but I'm more interested in making sure that the existing policy is applied. I want to hold institutions accountable for the commitments that they have made. So these are two ways that I could engage with the state as the primary focus. But perhaps the state is not the primary focus of my engagement because it is too far, it is too dangerous, or for other reasons, it is not a priority. Maybe the primary focus of my engagement is the community. Uh, and in the community, I might see some behaviors that are not uh, consistent or, or not conducive to this vision of development that I have. So I might activate myself, often together with others, to change the underlying perceptions, attitudes, values that are driving these behaviors. Or perhaps, I may not be so interested in changing behaviors or values per se, but rather in collaborating with others to, um, to meet existing needs, perhaps to fill gaps uh, in, in, the, in, in service or, or goods that are being delivered by the state or the market and so on and so forth. So you see a bit of a, type, of a typology emerging here with reference to the state as the primary focus, we talk about civic engagement for policy change, civic engagement for social accountability. With reference to the community as the primary focus, we talk about civic engagement for behavior change uh, or, or civic engagement for service delivery, if we want to use this expression, or perhaps, and I think it would be perhaps more accurate to say, civic engagement for the generation of new development, new development solutions. Of course, in reality, things are a lot more complicated than that. And we were discussing it this morning with Alberti. Because all these different modalities get mixed and matched in very complex ways. Sometimes they collapse into each other and so on and so forth. In any case, um, what we can see, and I think it's very easy for all of us to see how all of these different modalities of civic engagement are extremely important in different ways for just energy transitions, but in different ways. Uh, 
And we can also see how institutions have a very important role to play in enabling these different modalities of engagement. But then again, the required actions are different. So I guess the, the first message I'd like to convey, the message I'd like first maybe to start from, is that it is very important that we're being a bit of a, of a complexity mindset and the nuanced approach to this conversation. I know we will be hearing different examples, which I think will also make some of this a bit more concrete. So perhaps I, I leave it at this, and then I, I'm sure there will be other opportunities to, to dive further in as the conversation uh, unfolds. And thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Emanuele. And I really liked how uh, you link the civic engagement and empowerment with the values and perceptions and behavior change. Uh, and I think this is very, um, I would say, closely linked topic that, that we need to discuss because you cannot, you cannot talk about civic engagement until you talk about how, you know, people you know, changing their own behavior to get engaged into this into this discussion. So uh, with this, I think, you know, there are a lot of ground level work going on in India. Uh, and Shrestha is very much involved where uh, UNDP has also uh, signed uh, MOU with one of the state government uh, called Jharkhand, uh, where 70 to 80 percent of the GDP, uh, I think, is dependent on coal. And uh, Shrestha uh, from India Just Transition Center is our close partner where we are working together uh, and I wanted to bring you, Sresta, to talk about some of the ground level experiences, because uh, you are working on the topic of this just transition through a collective approach, putting people and communities at the center to fulfill both environmental and social obligation. So maybe you, you want to talk about a bit on the what are the social obligations, what are the challenges that you are facing and how you are trying to overcome that. So over to you, Sresta. Thank you, Piyush, and thanks UNDP, you know, for uh, organizing this important conversation uh, because, um, and I believe this is an important year for uh, this kind of uh, dialogue because it is also the year when the work program and just transition is also uh, at, uh, is a very important topic at the COP this year at UNFCCC, any, uh, all the platforms, in fact. Uh, so Piyush, to uh, respond to that, uh, you know, uh, we at the International Forum for Environment, Sustainable Technology, iForest, we have been working on the issue of just energy transition uh, for the last about five years. Um, and now uh, we are working in Jharkhand, but also in many states. And these states, what the commonality of most of these states, and particularly, I would say, at the district level, which is where the changes will take effect in the coming years, is that, that there is a significant something like Jharkhand has been highly fossil fuel dependent to be very precisely coal dependent. Uh, but the challenge is that when we look at various development indicators of many of the fossil fuel dependent regions is that uh, their economy is highly coal centric, but at the same time, there are challenges with, uh, you know, access to health infrastructure, health, good health resources, education, uh, good jobs, well paying jobs for that matter. These remain outstanding challenges. And uh, just to look at the, you know, coal dependent workforce, which has, which is one of the biggest um, uh focus of just transition deliberations is when we look into both into the uh, direct and indirect dependence, there is a large section which are informal. And these people have very poor means uh, of transition. Uh, they they have poor skill levels often, and also, you know, very low education levels. Now, when we just th think of a clean transition, transition to a clean energy economy, the fundamental question becomes, the adaptive capacity of these people left on of and these regions to the transition. So I think one of the fundamental social obligations for the just energy transition in countries like India and I'm, I'm and in various developing countries, in fact, this is a key issue, is that that it is essentially we must also look at it as a process as an opportunity of development intervention and not just as a transition from one energy source to another energy source. But fundamentally, what do I mean by development intervention is that I would say, how do we make this number one, the transition more inclusive? 
which means that it creates a better life for all and not just some of the formal workforce which are dependent on these fossil fuel industries, which has dominated the just transition discourse from a global north perspective so far. The second thing is, how do we diversify the economies in these regions which creates better work opportunities for many people and particularly the indirect and in, indirect workforce, which are around the value chain and you know, which is a vast number of people. And it will also help in the induced dependence, just as an example, like when we work at a district or uh, such as a coal district or any district for that matter, you know, uh, if this industry goes the hotel business will suffer. Many of the other small businesses in these regions will also suffer. It is not just the worker that will be uh, required a transition uh, support. So the fundamental issue also becomes that how we strengthen and diversify the economies of this region around clean energy sources, but also around other resources and create sustainable livelihood opportunities. That will be a key issue for and the third thing I think which becomes very important from an inclusion uh, transition perspective and as a so social obligation is to make sure that, you know, the development outcomes are being simultaneously supported to become better. And what do I mean by that is access to better education infrastructure, access to better health resources, all of that uh, clean water because why i say this because you know in the western countries when we look at how transition has moved on in some way it has been a fairly easier one of the key things that has supported the transition is basic access to public health care system or public education which people did not have to bother about so much uh, but this becomes a complex set of issues that just transition in india countries like india needs to look at uh, because unless we secure this upfront, it will be very difficult to secure a community buy-in for this transition. Because for them, it is, today I do not have my job and tomorrow I will not have, therefore I cannot have a school if a company goes because many of the infrastructure and facilities are supported by these industries. So for them, the, the normal perception is that, you know, if I do not have a job tomorrow, then I cannot afford many of the things. I can't send my child to a school. As basic as this. So fundamentally to me, the social obligation of just transition in our country will be therefore to create opportunities of better jobs even before we start the transition process. Uh, I think, you know, uh, there have, we, we were, I was in a meeting of IEA last, last week. And one of the things that we have been emphasizing on that, as long as much as we are phasing out fossil fuels, we must also phase in better jobs and better opportunities in these regions. So a phase out should be matched by a phase in. And, and unless we have that phase in, in the process built in, in, at, in terms of policies, in terms of plans, in terms of investments, uh, a social obligation for this uh, transition will never be fulfilled. Uh, the second point, Piyush, I'll just in, in, like, emphasize on, and uh, I'll leave to that, is that one of the biggest issue is also in inclusivity is community participation. Mm -hmm. Because for a just transition, one of the key pillars is social dialogue. And, but, but the challenge is that how do you create a platform for the social dialogue? Because as rightly Manuel said right now, it's a not easy conversation. It's a difficult conversation. Uh, and therefore, it has to be dealt with very sensitively. And one of the things is, therefore, how do you communicate this transition? And uh, I believe that one of the things is how do we communicate, but also how do we create a platform for formalized engagement? And I'm saying this from our own experience, not just working on just transition, but for you know working at the community level on various aspects of environment and development. Because a community participation is very different, like coming together and sitting in a meeting is very different from their voices getting integrated in the ultimate policies and plans that are being formulated. So how do you ensure that, that this community aspirations and community needs are actually captured, what they are coming and saying is actually re reflecting in the policies, plans and investments. And I think one of the fundamental things therefore that we need is strong institutions and formalized mechanisms to deliver on it. Uh, I'll stop to that Piyush and uh, happy to take forward next questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Srishta. Thanks for bringing uh, uh, yeah, so many important issues uh, from the diversification of economy to uh, the last point that you highlighted, the formalized engagement uh, and you know fulfilling the needs and aspirations of communities that is really, really critical, uh, which is for our work on energy governance, which we are doing here at the Sustainable Energy Hub, we are very much kind of looking at, uh, at that issue. Um, and I would like to, yeah, maybe deep dive, you know, in further conversation. Uh, yeah, I think there is a question is also coming, you know, like some of the concrete activities that you are doing, you know, in in India. So I'll take that later. Um, before that, um, uh, yeah, let's go to Kestosis. Uh, uh, Kestosis, so uh, you are coming from, you, you have two hats. Uh, one is from your European Economic and Social Committee, where you are looking at the broader European issues. And you also come from uh, Lithuania Consumer Alliance as the vice president. And uh, the question that I have, um, so we met uh, last year in high level political forum and I was fascinated with your um, with your presentation where you talked about Lithuania has uh, achieved um, around 100,000 electricity prosumers. So yes. there are in the country, 100,000 people who are producing their own electricity and maybe selling to the grid, if, I, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, so uh, yeah, I wanted to know like how you as a kind of uh, consumer alliance actively engaging into this discussion, what you are doing on you know, uh, empowering people to become prosumers. And maybe before that, uh, you also wanted to tell people like you know, our participants, what is, what is prosumer? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people joining from the governance side as well. Uh, apart from this energy people. So you want to highlight, uh, you know, uh, maybe a bit on, on prosumer. Oh, yes, sure. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction there, Piyush. And it was indeed a pleasure to meet you in July. Um, I'm looking forward for potential uh, other upcoming meetings uh, on during other high-level forums, perhaps. But uh, it's uh, quite a thing that makes me proud the Lithuanian prosumer scheme, but it sometimes takes you to have a trip to cross the Atlantics from Europe to New York to learn that, well, a, a term prosumer is probably not so much well known across the world. And my uh, US friends told me like prosumer, it's a concept that's more like used in, in, the, in, in Europe, less so in, in the US. I think that's that's probably the case, or maybe maybe they are not uh, not right. But uh, I believe that we simply blended the producing consumer words together, creating this uh, new term prosumer, and that's become part of the European uh, jargon. Yeah? Completely in the, it's not used uh, directly in in in, in legal uh, legal language but uh, we do that uh, you know we use that term uh, extensively in our um, everyday uh, work and uh, let me tell you a few words about what is the european economic and social committee so ecosoc is an abbreviation again widely used uh, in in the un but uh, at at the european level we use ecosoc for a, for a different type of of a, of a body and that's economic and social committee which is part of the european union um legislative machine so to say so we are advisory body consisting of free groups employers employees and uh, civil society organizations and what is a civil dialogue or a social dialogue is actually our everyday work so um let me now turn to the Lithuanian scheme, which I'm really so proud of. And uh, I could, you know, go ex an extra mile or a thousand of thousand miles to 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 educate uh, the world about uh, what we developed in our small country. So three million people in the country, only 1.2 around 1.2 million uh, households, and 1,000 uh, prosumers among that number of 1.2 million. So it's a bit less than 10%, but it's up and running. So it's the scheme is still at its early stages and we, we are growing. So uh, main features of the Lithuanian scheme, it's nationwide. So th there is no limitation. You can be a prosumer using uh, you know all the benefits wherever you live, wherever you consume or pro produce electricity. The grid acts as a virtual battery. 
it's not a new concept. It's just virtual battery concept. Yes, we have net metering, which may one day become net billing. That's now being discussed. It's digital. So to become a consumer, you only need uh, 15 minutes of your time just to, to become a consumer if you own property and if you want to buy, let's say, part of the electricity uh, production uh, plant. Huh? It's subsidized to help it kickstart, but it's mainly driven, driven by, by, by private money. So it's, it's, it's a way how to mobilize private resources to participate in green energy transition. It's about solar, solar PV, but the scheme is now being adapted to also uh, include wind solar farms. So wind energy is coming to every prosumer or to consumer. And another very important aspect that this scheme is quite nicely fitted to uh, quite nicely tuned to, to fit uh, poorer households, poor and vulnerable consumers. I will share a screen for a, for for literally one 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 minute, huh? so you could potentially learn main features of the scheme because it's I think it's quite important and I hope you can see my screen now. It's just one slide. So what you have on the screen here is actually just. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a main, uh, let's say, main, uh, a list of main features. Okay. So let me draw your attention literally to the following alternative. Alternative one is about owning an on, a, on the spot solar plant. And that's been already for ages, not for ages, okay, since 2015 where you have uh, some solar power plant on the property, on your roof, for example, and you have definitely the um, ability to consume and produce at the same pl uh, place. It's instant consumption, so you produce and you consume. Now, what was the major addition to that scheme back in 2019? And that was uh, a systemic innovation, I should say. It included technical innovation, um, legal innovation, financial innovation. So you could have an alternative way of producing and consuming solar energy. The legislation allowed virtual power plant. And from that moment, you could have a power plant somewhere with, where you don't live, huh? where, where you simply have your second address or uh, where you have a piece of land. So you produce electricity at one place and you consume it at another place. So that was a very important separation geographically. But there was no instant consumption option because that's, you know, that separation means that you simply give up the electricity to the grid and you get that electricity from the grid. It was a little bit different accounting. And another alternative introduced exactly at the same time was alternative number three, where you could simply have a piece of a power plant in a in a distant solar park. So that's that could be a park developed by some third party, a developer, uh, a specialized, a professional, you know, provider of solar park, um, you know, building services. So you could have a partial ownership. Imagine a, a solar park, which is one megawatt large, right? But you need one kilowatt only for your needs. So what you do, you buy 0.1% of that solar park. Yeah, that's one, one of the, of a thousand. And in that case, of course, we have the same features as here, right? So that was quite important uh, step because it opened uh, a, a huge uh, opportunity for every consumer. If you, even if you live in a flat, you can still own a piece of a solar plant. You don't need to have a roof to own a solar plant. Sorry, Piyush, you want to, to stop me at this point because I'm over my time? <laughs> Okay, I'm, 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 I, I hope that at least the scheme it, itself is very clear. And yeah, no, thank you. you need yeah. more details, please email me, you know, text me, whatever, you know, find me on social media because I'm really keen to explain it to anyone who has a, 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 an interest to, to learn more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kestosis. And thanks for clearly showing these three alternative pathways on becoming prosumers in uh, Lithuania. I think that was very helpful. Um,
with this, uh, now I would like to go to Bertha. Uh, uh, so um, over to you for, uh, you know, bringing a very different dimension to this conversation. Um, you are uh, you are a kind of global leader. You know, you are driving this woman participation in the energy uh, energy transition, uh, uh, broader energy access as well when we are talking about Africa. Uh, and I wanted to ask you uh, still, there are a lot of challenges that need to be solved, you know, uh, in terms of women participation. Um, the question for you that I have is, what progress have we made, you know, from your perspective, um, what progress have we made in ensuring women participation in the energy sector in Africa, especially in Africa, and what has worked, what hasn't worked, what challenges still remain? How do you see, you know, the challenges that still remain can be, can be solved? So over to you, Bata. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me um, uh, in, on this conversation. I'm recognizing colleagues that were together at the IEA um, Global Summit for People-Centered Just Energy Transition. You know, the question sounds simple, but it's very complex to answer. On the continent, we've got 600 million people who don't have access to electricity. We've got 900 million people who don't have access to clean cooking energy. We have a large percentage of the continent that is still not connected to a single grid. The Southern African power pool is the single most connected power pool and most advanced power pool on the continent, followed by the East African power pool that is uh, advancing connection, interconnectedness uh, between uh, the countries. So the, the continent itself is still um, working very hard to electrify and to ensure that there is access to electricity for industry, uh, for communities. Now, if you look at this from an ecosystem perspective, we advocate that as we connect um, countries to the grid and as we electrify, there are existing value chains that are being transformed and there are emerging value chains that are presenting new opportunities for employment and entrepreneurship. The foundation for participation and inclusion is co-creating shared meaning of these transitions. They're happening rapidly and they're happening in parallel. Unless we have shared meaning and shared understanding, it will be very difficult to enable inclusive participation. And what I mean by that, I use a very simple example. All of us uh, on this uh, webinar, as speakers and as participants, we have one thing in common. As soon as we can eat anything solid as infants, we, are, we encounter a teaspoon. Now, as learned as we are and as sophisticated as we are, very few of us can explain in the simplest terms the value chain of a teaspoon. Yet there is a plethora of entrepreneurial opportunities and employment opportunities that are embedded in that value chain. Now, when you take something as complex as electricity, you have to distill it to a language that is palatable and accessible to both the informal and formal sector. So the basic thing that we have invested ourselves in is orientating entrepreneurs that are in energy and those that aspire to be in energy on the construct of value chains, taking an ecosystem approach Invi inviting utilities to speak about their strategies, inviting OEMs to speak about technologies that are sought after by large power users and utilities, inviting finance institutions that speak on how they, they uh, finance energy projects of any size, so different funding tickets, and inviting entrepreneurs to give testimonies on how they have succeeded as women in their domestic markets. As you know, we've got 22 chapters on the market. We have showcased over 35 electricity markets on the continent. We have showcased over 16 um, finance institutions and over 20 OEMs that, are that dominate the African electricity market. 
Now, when you distill it to the community level, I'm always confronted with the question, what does the just energy transition mean to me? How do I go to my community and tell them of the benefits of just energy transition? And the gap that that question revealed was the lack of information that is written in languages and uh, terms that are understood by communities. Now, you cannot create shared meaning, shared understanding, and co-create solutions for communities when you're not even speaking the same language. Some of the terms that are used in the concept of just energy transition and when you break it down in its enormity don't exist in other languages. In my country, South Africa, we've got 11 official languages. In Nigeria, there is over 100 languages, and so it goes across all 55 countries. It should be our first commitment to ensure that these policies that we are translating into tailored policies for each domestic market are translated into languages that are easily accessible by all, so that this multiple transitions that will run concurrently that will be vastly different from the global north are understood by everyone. Then you can speak about inclusivity. So what has worked for us is our webinars have been very informative, have been able to stimulate interest for entrepreneurs to want to participate in the energy sector because they must be aware of the opportunities, they must know where to access support resources, they must know where the um, entry points that present the lowest barriers to entry across these value chains are for them to organize, to bid, to compete, to win and sustain in their businesses. The second part uh, that we launched was the Just Energy Transition Skills Development Program, where we teach on the policies themselves. What are the policies per domestic market? How do they influence uh, value chains? And how do utilities ensure grid stability um, and, and safety as they integrate renewable energy? And we have found that this has empowered utility officials to become just energy transitions champions in their utilities who then stimulate microeconomies through procurement in their jurisdictions. So you have to take a very very uh, out of the box approach to creating platforms or to stimulating inclusivity by educating, by supporting and designated real financial resources to and to support my colleague Sretha, um, what she has said, uh, creating platforms for formal and informal dialogue cost money. It is not something that can be delivered on the back of volunteerism. In the same vein that socioeconomic, de socioeconomic development cannot be delivered at the back of volunteerism. You need experts in anthropology. You need experts in energy economics that will work together to distill these very complex terms and, and systems into easily accessible, palatable uh, content pieces that are delivered at the level uh, of the community sensitively with a contextual understanding of that environment. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Bertha. Thanks so much for uh, really highlighting the fundamental issue of the language in terms of, you know, uh, customizing the policies that you are talking about in, in, in local languages so that people can really understand what's um, what's in for them and how they need to participate. So I think I think uh, at the Sustainable Energy Hub as well, we are trying to um, bring this kind of importance of language and Riyadh is very strongly working working on that. So uh, no, thanks very much for highlighting. Um, uh, David, over to you. Um, so you are coming as a as a youth representative. Uh, you are part of our advisory group as well. Thanks thanks for your contribution. Uh, you know through through the advisory group, and you have also been the focal point for SDG seven for the UN, uh, as I understand. So um, you have been globally involved, and I wanted to ask you uh, maybe some of the you know some of the success stories of youth engagement in the energy transition. Maybe from Africa. Maybe from you know at the global level. And 
personally, I see there are a lot of success stories in every sector that really need to be scaled and replicated. You know, it's an easy kind of, you know, there are success stories which you can take it, you know, to other jurisdiction, maybe customize a bit. Uh, but that's a still not, not, you know, I think we are not doing a good job in terms of a scaling and replication of what we have done already. So I wanted to bring you, uh, you know, from that lens, like, yeah, if you have any success stories on youth engagement, uh, maybe share that and what are the challenges you still see, how we can overcome that? Thank you so much, Piyush, for the question. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, excellent. It's such a pleasure to be here. A lot of regards and thanks to um, the UNDP Sustainable Energy Hub, led by Dr. Riyad Medeb and the awesome team, at the, the UNDP uh, Sustainable Energy Governance team. Well, I'm privileged to serve and work with incredible experts from across the globe. Thanks to you, panelists, also on the call, and also to our audience. I'm joining from every part of the world, I, I reckon. Thank you, Piyush, for those questions. Uh, I, I would say it's, I, I'm very excited, um, excited for so many reasons. One, why am I excited? I've seen that youths are now not no longer relegated to the background, but also seen as active participants um, if we are going to uh, tra transition in an inclusive manner because they come with their ideas, they come with their resilience, they come with their solutions. And we begin to see some very successful um, um, opportunities for engagement through different energy institutions across the globe, like the UNDP, who has in itself set up several initiatives that create that nexus, you know, for 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 youth participation through um the program um, the the program where it provides some funding to youth led projects and on climate and energy, um to also the the energy governance team and and also through its accelerator programs that he has set to further help turn idea and uh, youth ideas to product. And one of the things I would say, um, speaking from the lens of Africa and also more specifically in Nigeria, where I, I live and work, is um, youth entrepreneurship has a very critical role to play when it comes to uh, uh, scaling the energy transition. Um, we, we are all aware of the data in terms of the energy gap. We're also uh, aware of the data in the financing gap, but we have also seen that companies, if um, and youth led startups and youth led um, initiatives, if given the right kind of support, hand holding support, technical assistance to engender um, commercial viability of their businesses, um, commercial, um, um, some sort of bankability of their businesses, and also. Um, if they're rightly supported to position for scale, they can do tremendous work. Through the work that I do in Nigeria, through uh, uh, through the implementing partner for the United States African Development Foundation in Nigeria, most of the companies we work with at are early and mid-stage renewable energy companies led by youth. And we've seen some of them um, become 30 under 30 CEOs. We've seen some of them also receive their first financing of a couple of tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to becoming multi-million dollar companies in a very short time. Okay. Addressing this energy gap in their local communities, you know, having that local understanding of their markets, but also being able to close financing, which we are seeing to scale. We've also seen that um, one of the very good successes as well is also donors recognizing that the funds that they can they can fund certain programs you know and provide some sort of capacity building and hand holding, holding for businesses to engender um, um, investor readiness and so um, we've seen that catalytic capital is not enough for us to be able to trans um, to, to scale the kind of solutions that we see on the ground however if catalytic capital is applied in the right way it can help support all those stages around R&D, going through multiple levels of iteration, getting a product that can now be, you know, um, investable because some, energy is a business and it must be paid for. And you see that some investors are not really re interested in funding um, a start, um, um, businesses that at their inception stages. But once you prove some level of commercial viability, that you, have, you have walked through your concept uh, and it, it looks like something that would scale, then you begin to see that sort of um, finance flowing. However, um, 
if you look at the the continent as well, as well, of Africa, where we have loads and loads and millions of people who do not have access to energy, you see that there's still a very huge gap. And what are those things that we can begin to do? I I couldn't have said it better than better did by talking about you know the language barriers. And so it's important that we take our advocacy a step further because people can only address issues that they understand and that are that they are aware that it even exists you know and so if we do not put, do a lot of work in engendering advocacy in letting and people know that this is the challenge, this is the solution that we have. They also have a role to play and clearly help them define the roles that they have to play. You know, we would not be able to achieve a just transition in an inclusive manner. One also, one other critical thing um, we have also seen is the place of skills. Uh, and when it comes to skills that are relevant for uh, the green, for green jobs and also for the transition, you want to look at it from two parts. One, there are people that would have to go through formal education, go through a university system or a polytechnic system, you know, and gain skills that can come. Like, for example, you had um, um, skills like uh, anthropologists, um, uh, econo energy economists. You need to go to uh, through a formal education to kind of build a sort of competency. However, on the other hand, for what we are beginning to see as well, there is a need for you to also consider the informal craftsman's market, where you also need to be able to have programs that ensure that you educate people who may not necessarily have a formal education, but have a role to play as installers, as marketers, as sales agents, and many more other skills that are relevant also for the transition. As I like to pause on this first phase of answering this question, I'd like to also mention that it is also, I see, I see you, Piyush, I'm trying to wrap up quickly. You know, and as I try to wrap up, I, one thing I also see that it's also relevant that we spend a lot of time on curriculum development, both on the formal and the informal side. Because when we also ensure that people are learning what is relevant towards addressing their challenges, likely we are beginning, we are, we are able to also see some sort of accelerated solution providing towards these challenges that exist, both in the local and the global context. I'll post your page. I'll be happy to go on again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, thank you for bringing a really important perspective, both from this uh, the skills and education and youth engagement, and also from the finance side. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's great. I, I'm sorry, I, I I can't stop. We are running, we are running behind. But <laughs> everybody's contribution is so critical, so important that it's hard to stop, right? When you are speaking. Uh, but before I take the question, I would uh, uh, request our participants. You know, please raise your hand or post your questions here directly so that we can go to the speaker for uh, you know for your respective questions. Uh, before that, I wanted to go to, uh, for a special appearance, uh, we have got from the UNDP Accelerator Lab, uh, Alberto Cortica uh, is here, who is uh, very much involved into uh, UNDP Accelerator Lab, is doing a lot of civic engagement activities, uh, not necessarily energy, but many other sectors as well. And I think there are a lot of uh, best practices from there that can be uh, applied into this energy transition. Um, Alberto, I wanted to give you maybe two minutes uh, to briefly uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, bring bring your perspective, and then we can go for the questions. Uh, thanks a lot. I mean, my, my perspective is not really that interesting, but what, what is interesting is that the Accelerator Lab has this network of uh, 91 labs in, in several countries, and some of them are, are doing really great work. So here I'm representing uh, the work of my colleagues, in fact, in South Africa. And um, what happened there is that uh, there is a, a, a presidential commission um, a presidential energy commission, which is uh, uh, supporting this just energy transition idea. And it is quite difficult to involve communities because uh, as, as it, it tends to be the case in these cases, you get a, the, the benefits and the costs of a just energy, of, of an energy transition of uh, decommissioning the coal uh, plants of South Africa, which is an international commitment that they have they are not located in the same places. So that there are some local communities that see themselves as big losers in, in, in this type of transition. And so they are quite worried. And, and I, I heard Strat say, uh, yeah, you know, what about the employment of those people? 
Uh, and uh, I heard Bertha saying, we don't speak the same language. We need to ensure shared understanding. So what the lab did there is that they used the, what they call social citizen science in order to talk to the communities. And that basically means they partnered up with a youth-led organization and they deployed young people as researchers. And they not only delivered the survey, but also, uh, again, to, to Bertha's point of we need anthropologists, some kind of qualitative anthropological uh, research in a way. So they had long uh, discussions around the questions of the survey. And they reported back some voices that are normally not heard. So two thirds of the respondents were women and 30% of the respondents were people under 30. And they brought a, a point of view, the perception of the transition the, of, from the point of view of these communities. Uh, Results are many, and you can read about this. There is a, a report on collective intelligence called Antat that we released last week, but let me just name one. So it turns out that the perception of the just energy transition was better when people mentioned health benefits and retraining opportunities, because coal mining is well paid, but it's very unhealthy, and people know this on their skin, right? So. Uh, this opens some leverage points that the transition can, can use in the future as it's trying to uh, onboard these communities. I would stop here to not take any more of your time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Alberto, for bringing this UNDP as a lab perspective and what's going on there. That's very helpful. Um, now we will like to go directly to uh, take some of the questions that are coming in the chat box and the Q&A box. Uh, Geoffrey, uh, do you want to ask or bring someone uh, from the participants? Yes, uh, thank you so much. That has been very interesting and uh, the chats are quite active. I'm sure colleagues, you can see that. Uh, a lot of questions coming in, a lot of follow-ups on, on this. So I'll just uh, perhaps run through a few that have come in and just to bring it to your attention. Perhaps when you take the next round, they can uh, somehow be res uh, uh, responded to. And as Annette said, is requesting for some practical examples on what UNDP is doing in this area, particularly bringing women and youth employment investments in this area. And, and, and she's talking about uh, the marginalized pastoralist communities that are a very diverse community that's most often left out of this uh, uh, just energy transition conversation. Shelton Sabasi is uh, asking, uh, mentioning that it's really important to highlight the point, there's nothing for us without us. Uh, just emphasizing the importance of engagement and, and also mentioning that uh, the use of energy modeling tools could help ensure that everybody is really brought, brought on the table. Uh, Loretta has a question for Sritha on what is the Indian government currently doing in terms of retraining uh, the coal mining communities? I, I don't know whether such kind of programs are happening in Jakarta. <laughs> you could maybe mention uh, whether they are in, in, on track or not yet. And what type of quality jobs are available for such coal workers? I want to link this to the point that Rinse mentioned on, on, on the young people. And, and how do we also bring the, the informal uh, uh, training opportunities into this kind of uh, con con conversation? Mabuti Maloba is also asking uh, with regard to um, uh, how do you ensure that proper structures are in place? Because this point of structures was, was, was really highlighted by Batha. Uh, what kind of structures can be able to ensure that informal communities are, are also involved in this conversation? So that's another question that came in from, from that perspective. Uh, now, if I could take just one on the Q&A, which is very interesting, which we could also try to respond to, is from Prashant. I think Prashant is from Ukraine. Is 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 on the just transition of women engagement. Uh, he would like to understand what is the level of women involvement in terms of the percentage in energy sector in Africa, especially South Africa and the Eastern Green, uh, Grid Pool. Uh, with, uh, this is an important gender, gender dimension question. As we speak about inclusion, are we getting some bit of data on engagement and participation of, of women? These are just a few that have come in. Perhaps we could take that, but there are two hands that are raised. Yeah. If we could bring in the first person who's raised the hand or, or what is your guidance? Uh, um, Geoffrey, uh, maybe maybe we can, uh, you know, give 30 seconds to, you know, some of the panelists to respond to some of these questions yes. and then we can bring them in. Okay. 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 
Yeah. So uh, you have heard the questions and uh, let me tell you which question you want to respond, you know, come in directly here. Maybe uh, some of you want to come in. Yeah. Srista, do you want to take the question on, on, on Indian government? What, what's going on there? Sure. Uh, so uh, I think Jeffrey partly uh, alluded to it, you know. Uh, so uh, as of now, uh, to very precisely respond that there is no targeted intervention to support the transition communities. Uh, so if not, not a sort of through a, a targeted skill training programs for these people. But what is happening is, and recently we have concluded a study in Maharashtra, uh, uh, and it's 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 a cross sectorial evaluation, not just related to coal, but various sectors. And we looked into the jobs uh, aspect and the skilling ecosystem, particularly. Uh, what is important to understand is that there are many skill development programs that are currently in place by the government of India, and the 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 opportunity at in hand at present is that how do mm -hmm. you design the skilling opportunities and um, engage these people in those skill development programs. Because as I said, there is a large amount of people who are informal and who are induced. And first and foremost, you know, it's very easy to say that informal people should be trained, they should be brought into the uh, system and all of that. But number one challenge always we face in ground is to actually to quantify the number. How many informal workers? Who are these informal workers? And that quantification requires rigorous survey and understanding. And I think what we have at iForest has been trying to do in that manner in our studies, and that was one of the questions was there earlier also, that Piyushu posed is that we undertake ground surveys to quantify the number of informal workers, map their skill levels, map their education levels, and do a skill gap assessment. That's number one in that informality. Number two is, you can map the job eco uh, skilling ecosystem that is currently present and there are skilling programs that are being operated by the government of India, the central government and both by the state government, where there is some sort of funds that is there. And Bertha rightly mentioned that nothing happens without money. So there are some amount of money in these programs, which can be utilized to kickstart on these measures and bring this people together so we can do the skilling programs but one of the important things about the skilling program is also to look into the new economy related skillings i'm giving you an example of a report we did and i'll stop to that on automobile for example how do you transition the informal sector uh, in the automobile industry and when we looked at that we did the kind of courses that are there currently it's a sunrise sector in india and the jobs uh, the training programs are not designed for the ev ecosystem now, this is what is required to design the skilling programs for the new jobs and not just the existing kind of uh, work, which is, uh, you know, that are there. so uh, I think that is something Pius, that will be important, uh, as I said. And the last thing I would like to say that another important issue, since we are talking of India and, you know, coal regions, the, there is a pot of, there are some amount of local amount of resources such as we work on district mineral foundation trust funds, which are mining companies are paying, which is a welfare fund or the corporate social responsibility fund, CSR funds, which provides for rescaling and livelihood generation. So if this money can be pulled in to support kickstart some of the skilling and upskilling measures, it can provide effective intervention at the very initial phases. Thank you. Thanks, Trista. Uh, anybody else wants to come in? I see some of you are typing. Some of the speakers are uh, responding the questions in the chat box. But uh, if anybody wants to come in for 30 seconds to respond to any of the questions online. Anyone? Uh, I will say, so one of the, area, one of the areas that uh, uh, requires um, directed investment is data. Uh, and I think that's what uh, Sreta is, sorry, I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but that's what my colleague was saying, that we need to uh, invest in um, surveys that can tell us exactly the baseline of uh, inclusion. Uh, and we need to be able to do this for both the informal sector and the formal sector. Um, I know for a fact that utilities, uh, 
electricity utilities in uh, Kenya, electricity utilities in South Africa, both ESCOM and the municipalities have designated 30% of their procurement for women entrepreneurs. But the take up is not more than 10% in both countries and i know the 30 percent designation for sdg5 is prevalent across many utilities but the take up is in some areas less than five percent so there is a bridge that is necessary and that is access to finance access to technology access to market access to skills development access to networks um, and if you uh, if you integrate these uh, interventions in an ecosystem approach you create a supportive net for uh, first-time players in the energy space uh, um, uh, to penetrate the formal sector, especially women, youth, and persons with disability, which interesting enough in the entire conversation we have not touched. There isn't a, a single atlas that I've come across in the entire world that says, these are the categories of disability that can operate in these areas of renewable energy value chains as employees or as entrepreneurs. Now, if we are not being deliberate in defining what that is, how are we going to be inclusive? Very good point, Bertha. Thanks for bringing that. Uh, Emmanuel, 30 seconds wanted to give you like, yeah, you wanted to come in. Sure, thanks Piyush. Uh, just, there was a question, there was a general question about what your NDP is doing. And I want to be able to speak maybe to the to the specific elements of the energy programming, but on issues of participation more, more broadly. In many contexts, UNDP is working with institutions to support institutions in structuring processes of consultation. And there is a lot of methodological work that needs to be done in order for, for institutions, for all of us to be able to do that well. And, and Bertha, I could not agree with you more on the fundamental importance of developing methodologies that, that allow uh, uh, everybody to, to, to participate meaningfully, that, that make complex issues more accessible to, to a diverse public. There are other things as well. But, and, I, and I'd really like to stress this, all these processes of consultation may not necessarily mean much if they're not embedded in a broader context of civil freedoms. Uh, consultation will not necessarily mean much if it happens in a context where people are not able to associate freely or speak freely or where you know environmental human rights defenders are harassed with impunity and so on and so forth. So UNDP also works with government counterparts and, and other partners to strengthen civic space, to make sure that civic space is more generally enabling of, of genuine uh, meaningful dialogue on key development issues, including energy transitions. Of course, there will be a lot more, but let me leave it at this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emanuele. Uh, Geoffrey, do you wanted to bring uh, two uh, participants, Norola and Stephen? They wanted to ask some quick questions, quick, right? Um, yes, Norala, you can uh, go ahead. Yes, okay. thank you very much. And thank you actually for the for the speaker. This is very important uh, thematic area that the question. Actually, <laughs> I benefited a lot from all uh, presented material, but I have one question to uh, Arinza David that is related to the uh, research and development in the energy sectors, particularly for the youth. If there is any partnership with universities and uh, research centers that promote this kind of uh, youth innovations in the, in the access to energy and in promoting actually uh, a new uh, energy technologies is, uh, is, is, is a general actually to the, to the users and to the uh, entrepreneurs as well. If there is any kind of partnership yeah. and success story, I would like to hear. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Norla, for the question. Uh, Stephen. No, I think we can. Okay. Perhaps uh, proceed. Yeah, yeah oh, maybe. Stephen, David are you can... on? Just proceed, yeah. His hand was brought down, yeah. Okay, David, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yes, I'll just quickly. No, no, say his, that... his hand is back now, so maybe we can give him a chance after David. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, okay. All right. Okay. I will just I will just quickly say that um, thank you so much, Narela, for that question. Yes, uh, through the SDG Seven Youth Constituency, we have an initiative called the Sustainable Energy Hub. You know, and the Youth Sustainable Energy Hub, and through this, um, it, see it as an atlas that showcases youth uh, projects across um, the globe who have signed up to the program either uh, seeking one form of capacity building or the other one form of technical assistance or the other and even financing. And we've seen that some of these companies that um, joined the earlier cohort around 2021, 2022 uh, have even gone on to scale their businesses. Uh, we've seen some success stories in Argentina, you know, in Latin America, also in Africa of youths who have scaled their enterprises from um, and, and even close full on financing. And, and we have seen even seen some of them go ahead to win some innovation awards and all of that. So we have seen some success stories and we are very open to invite uh, to institutions. We have received some level of expression of interest from institutions across the globe, um, universities who are interested also ensuring that they can partner, you know, to either bridge, either if it's a knowledge gap, because we have youths from across over 100 plus countries as at today who are at different stages of their lives. The constituency is made up of young professionals, students, entrepreneurs who are who have different needs. And for us, we serve as that platform to match make those who have different needs with opportunities for them to bridge those bridge those gaps. Of course, at the end of the day, um, uh, we cannot achieve the energy transition that we seek and the transition to a clean energy future if we don't all work together. So we are very open for collaboration, happy to um, engage with us. And um, of course, the, the I'll put the website for the constituency on the chat so that you can make sure that you can engage with us further for and then we'll be happy to receive it. To follow on from there. Huge back to you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Stephen, very quickly, your question. Is he here, Geoffrey? Yes, yes, his hand is raised. Stephen, uh, I think you can proceed. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, a, a, a very quick question. Thank you very much for uh, this very impressive discussion. I have just one question, which the panelists can possibly elaborate a little bit. Um, for uh, just an inclusive energy transition to be really inclusive, um, we uh, what we have observed is most of the discussions tend to focus on uh, clean energy, you know, renewable energy, uh, a little bit about energy efficiency, and extremely very little about clean cooking. Uh, I just wanted to hear how from the panelists, how we can make the discussion more balanced in a way that it is more inclusive to include all aspects of uh, clean energy transition. Over. Uh, who wants to respond very quickly to this question? Any one of you? Berta, do you want to take this? <laughs> I had a suspicion that you'd ask me to take this. <laughs> so um, the reason our I, I'm just giving an example of our, of our programs, um, the reason we look at the policy of just energy transition followed by value chains, not only um, a renewable energy value chains, non-renewable and renewable um, and renewable value chains, because the African Union has determined on the continent that to electrify the continent will use all its abundant resources. So we do not focus only on a renewable energy. We focus on both non-renewable and renewable energy. After we've done uh, the policies, the value chains, then we look at uh, the utility and the impact of the transition on uh, the utility because we believe the utility is the executor of the policy and they stimulate market growth. And in between that, there are nuances that um, uh, involve a stakeholder, a stakeholder engagement at a community level, at an entrepreneurial level, uh, and, um, and, and other um, relevant stakeholders. So to deliver an all encompassing just energy transition intervention, you have to look at the human impact and the environmental impact of the transition. And then based on the resources that are available to you that are often limited, curate a program that is fit for purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Berta. Uh, uh, 
we are already one minute over time and I wanted to take four more minutes to close. So uh, I wanted to give each panelist um, just a one sentence closing message, just literally one sentence closing message. So thank you to our participants for your presence. And uh, yeah, before we close, uh, I wanted to start with you, David. You're muted, you're muted, you're muted. Thank you so much, Piyush. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. It just started raining. It, it just means that um, there's a lot of blessings, you know, with this webinar and uh, it's really been an exciting time here. Uh, I think that um, we need everyone in the room, all those listening to us and even those who are not in the room, if we're going to transition towards a cleaner energy future. It must be people-centered. It must be people-focused. It must be inclusive. And um, it, it must be one that recognizes also the need for gender parity. And, you know, and as we walk through our programs, we must aggressively see how we can bridge the various gaps, you know, gaps in inclusion, gaps in gender, gaps in financing, because everyone needs to come together if we're going to really achieve the future that we seek. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Berta, over to you. Um, I want to really uh, thank you for organizing this webinar. Um, we continue to learn from the different perspective and the nuanced approaches um, and to support uh, what my colleague David has said. Let's put people in the center and co-create the solutions and interventions with people, not uh, outside of that formation. Thanks. Thank you, Berta. Thanks. Uh, Kestutis, over to you. Yes, I was immediately fascinated when uh, Berta previously earlier mentioned that the utility is the executor of marketplace. And I wanted to respond immediately because that suddenly got so deeply in, in tune with uh, our own situation. Despite our differences, I see that systemically we are in the same uh, situation. When you have to potentially in the system, identify the most important actor. It could be a utility. In our case, it was the, the distribution system operator. If that actor has a veto power, you have to work with that actor, first of all, to make sure that this actor does not veto your uh, civil society engagement initiative. So that was a really nice click uh, between uh, quite different regions, so to say. And uh, I, I'm thankful for uh, for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thanks, Kestetis. Uh, Srishta, over to you. Oh, Piyush, just one line, because, you know, the focus of the, today's discussion is civic engagement. And my only one thing I really think we need to be careful about is the issue of civic engagement of what is we are talking of just transition should not come as an afterthought of the energy transition. Often we discuss the energy transition, we discuss about the technology and all of things. And then there is somewhere where we think of the engagement. I think that's what needs to be really addressed. It must be brought upfront and integrated in the process and in every step of be it planning, be it financing, be it policy development. And I think as much as we can integrate it as you know, not just an afterthought as an obligation. I think that will make the difference. And that is what we need to really work forward as we are working in policy and public engagement sphere. Thank you, Shrestha. Thanks very much. Emmanuel, over to you for final, final closing message. That's before. Uh, okay, so at first sight, it might appear as if participation and inclusion are going to slow us down, actually. I think they are key accelerators. Without participation and inclusion, we will not be able to achieve a common understanding of what just means in just energy transitions. And we will not be able to achieve the whole of society mobilization that is needed to reach the depth and breadth of transformation that, that, that we require. So thanks for the space. Thanks for the opportunity to think about this together and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Emanuele. And thanks to all of our uh, speakers for bringing really, really important insights to this conversation. Uh, thanks to all our participants for joining and for your very, very uh, the critical questions. Uh, 
uh, stay tuned. Um, as uh, I initially we mentioned, this was our third webinar under energy governance that we are uh, doing, uh, this deep dive series. Uh, the last is focused on oversight. How do you create appropriate and independent oversights? And uh, that will be held in next two weeks, where we'll focus on the role of consumer protection agencies, parliamentary bodies, uh, anti-corruption agencies, human rights agencies, what kind of capacity building need to be provided to these institutions so that they can come and play an active role into this just transition, uh, energy transition discussion. So thank you again. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, Srista, you wanted to say something? Okay, I, I see your hand. So yeah. Okay, it was a mistake, I guess. Okay. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. And goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.